Well, on port congestion, is it a small problem or a state of emergency? Those stories and much more coming up on Freight Waves Now. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday, and welcome to our last day of Freight Waves Now for this week. I'm your host, Kaylee Nix, here with Anthony Smith. That's right, and on this Friday, we have a jam-packed show coming up. We'll talk to Alan Adler in his weekly truck tech segment. Plus, Rachel Premack had an interesting discussion with a fuel executive about decarbonization. But first, our top story of the day, we head to Chicago, Illinois, home of Four Kites, where layoffs were announced through a company email yesterday. Grace Sharkey is here to fill us in. Grace, let's talk about kind of the latest updates. Four Kites, now the most recent large freight tech company to announce these layoffs as we're coming into this tight market. Tell us a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, we recently received an email from a customer of the company that uh, dove into a lot of the uh, issues that they're having with one of their acquisitions last year, Haven. Now, uh, when Four Kites acquired Haven, part of that deal was to combine Haven's document management systems with their own systems to create Dynamic Ocean, which would create a track and trace slash document management global shipping platform, right? Um, and what we learned through this individual, uh, this source who wanted to remain anonymous for um, uh, just for purposes of retaliation, uh, is that it, the document management piece never really worked out that the way it did. So this is a two-part story. We have a piece of technology that's uh, being questioned, right? As we saw in that email, a big part of this was that the board of the company wanted to go through a full product portfolio review and and like they said, aligned to market realities, a lot of what we're seeing across a number of tech companies today. And I think part of that uh, strategy was also looking into the employees and different positions within the company that also align with the current market realities. So uh, in both situations, there was the uh, unfortunate layoff to a number of employees. Uh, that was confirmed by Four Kites and uh, sources outside of the company as well. Um, but uh, a part of the story that I was working on, uh, almost in, tang in tandem with this exact layoff story, was a, a large product that the company had hoped would uh, have paid off in the long run. Now, um, uh, in the email, which was from the CEO and founder, um, Matt, they did explain that it was one of the most unprofitable pieces. Uh, now, I will say that in Borkite's response, they did say that in tangent with Dynamic Ocean, it was profitable. Uh, I will let the audience choose to, to how they want to gauge those two opinions. But um, I think what's interesting, and even from this customer's perspective, is that that documentation piece never truly came to fruition, which was the main point of the acquisition. Um, and I think that there's likely a due diligence or a... Um, uh, an understanding when it was acquired that they would be able to get a number of these BCOs to participate more than they had. Uh, you know, we hear about this rhetoric a lot with a lot of freight tech companies, especially in disability. Uh, if everyone works together, right, if we can all share systems, if we can all uh, integrate together, that'll be a, a better, brighter world. Well, in some cases, that's not 100% possible. And I think in this one, it was assumed that a lot of the extra costs would be um, maybe eaten by some of those implementation partners uh, in order to have a, a better system, bring in more customers, et cetera. Uh, but that situation never actually occurred. So uh, it's really a two-part story of what we're seeing just in general for freight tech companies across the board, uh, especially ones that have raised a lot of money. Those boards are going to want to make sure that we're starting to see profits sometime soon and a lot of times that means going through the products that you have available and and making sure they're actually uh bringing in money to the company and not performing uh, a loss over time and misfiring miscommunication mismanagement 
And really speaking on mismanagement, do you see this investment as being a mismanaged opportunity or really just a bad investment from the beginning? Uh, I see. I think when it, uh, so we've got this really intense, uh, I'd say technological uh, race to the top between a number of visibility players. Uh, the top, right? You see our project forty four and four kites. Um, you've got overhaul. You've got a number of companies within that that we see recently, even in, in Gardner studies as well. And I think that this original move was made to make sure that that four kites had remained on top. There had been a number of acquisitions at the time by its competitor, uh, and especially in this space and ocean visibility. And this was, I mean, even talking to the customer who wanted this piece, you know, this was something that they needed. The document side is something that they needed in order to improve the piece of their business. Um, and I think at the time it was, uh, it was acquired to make sure that they had the exact same uh, firepower as maybe their competitors. Uh, but unfortunately, it just didn't work out the way that it was. And so now they're breaking it, uh, breaking it up and still, I, I will still have some type of documentation process, I'm sure, available to, the, to their customers over time. But doing it through this piece is just something that, uh, that didn't work out after it was acquired in 2021 uh, and still hasn't worked out and, and is now being, uh, by the end of this year, all customers will be off of Haven uh, and, and will no longer be working off of that, but just through their ocean uh, uh, dynamic system. So uh, I think it it might have been a speedy acquisition to keep up with uh, their current competitors in the space. Uh, one that they're hoping with the talent that they have within their four walls, they could probably fix and manage better. Uh, but unfortunately, like I said, if all parties involved with the transaction, involved with the system, isn't on board for the greater good of the cause, uh, there's not much more that, that uh, four kids can do to make sure that this works out for them in the long run. So going forward for Four Kites, they're obviously going to restructure their portfolio a little bit and kind of realign their goals and their priorities. Where does that take them now looking ahead to the future? Well, I think this is something we're seeing from every single freight tech company right now is that um, to be involved in the future, to be an existing player in the future, you have to make those really tough decisions right now. And uh, a lot of, like I said, a lot of them have a, a number of backers behind them that are probably poking and prodding during these times saying, what is that profit looking like? All, all of these promises that uh, a number of these investors have been told they're, they want to see that, you know, actually come to the table. So uh, I, to say that Four Kites is going to completely fall apart because of something like this, I think that's way too early and, and way too um, drastic to say right now. Um, but I think it shows that they uh, want to be a competitor in the future. And if that means taking this huge step and, and saying, you know, this, this acquisition didn't work out and we're looking towards the future in order to, you know, keep a product like this on the table for our customers. That's one thing. I think it's going to be a little bit of a struggle against their competitors who do have this platform available because now you do have a bunch of customers out there looking for a solution. Uh, so that's not the best position to be in at this time, clearly. Uh, but uh, it's, it's an unfortunate event that you're going to have to learn now to figure out how to manage around. So, Grace, let's kind of frame this in a larger scape of what's going on in the freight tech market. You mentioned it about a month and a half ago as we kind of turned into the middle part of Q2 and started seeing this economic decline. We're going to start seeing that people are demanding results and demanding actual proof of the concept and proof of the product, whether that's your customers who bought in initially, whether that's your investors who decided to pour some of this VC money into these large companies like this, they want to know that it's working because we're not in a market anymore where the hope of it is going to keep it alive, right? We are at a place now where the proof has to be in the pudding in your cup right now. So can you talk to us a little bit about how kind of this fits into that larger scale and what that means for Four Kites going forward, taking on some of their priorities? You know, uh, I think in my conversation with this source in particular and, and the email, there's a really interesting 
uh, rhetoric that they have, have brought up. That's something I think I've, I've heard from a number of people who might not even be using a lot of these visibility products. Uh, at the end of the day, visibility is a very interesting term. And if you can't get one, the carriers on board with it in order to properly bring that visibility to the table, then that's uh, where do we even stand truly as an as a industry with visibility? Um, and this was not just uh, looking at, at four kites, but every single player out there. Uh, here's the, the great thing about freight tech. Every team has an incredible sales force, and you would be surprised what a lot of these players can, can sell and push to their customers. But the biggest issue is what happens next? What's happening in implementation? What hiccups are occurring? And in this case, um, you know, this company wanted the document software management tool. They're having issues with uh, port shipments being uh, stuck because they didn't have the right documents in place. And this is what that tool was promised to be. And this is the one thing that never actually truly worked for these customers. And so I think for this source, and I'm sh I, I hear this from others when talking about vis visibility in space, it takes, uh, it's gonna take a different approach, I think in the future to uh, get these different players, not just the global shippers themselves, but even down to the actual truck drivers, right? Uh, they're going to have to be a part of this and they're going to want to have to give up their, their data and their information in order to make all this work. So uh, I think it's just a really uh, interesting case for anyone out there looking to invest in a better visibility solution to really do your due diligence and really ask a lot of questions and, and figure out long term, like what the company is doing, where they're at, and and, and what products they are focused on. Uh, because I've I've heard this uh, this critique of an of an early place that at the end of the day, uh, if you don't have the the carries behind it participating in the grand uh, ecosystem of things, it's just not doing much more than than the teams can do themselves, especially this individual who has a, working a number of shipments globally on uh, a single day. So uh, I think I'd like to see improvement in regards to the value of a lot of the visibility players out there. And hopefully this article kind of pushes them to realize that, you know, uh, all these shippers that made investments in 2021 and want a more agile supply chain with better visibility, as many buzzwords that we want to use, it's not doing anything once it's value. Grace, excellent points this entire morning. Thanks so much for joining us for this top story. And we'll be sure to check in with you, I'm sure, as the story develops and everything that you're really working on. Thank you guys so much. Have a good morning. Have a great weekend, Grace, as always. Right now, we're going to toss it over to the wall. We've got our first carrier update this morning. Thomas Watson is in for Tony Mulvey. He joins Donnie Gilbert. Welcome to our first carrier update. I'm indeed Thomas Watson. Joining me, Mr. Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, we've got a lot going on today. This was brought to you by Power Fleet, by the way, and Uptake in the bottom right-hand corner. Thank you, Uptake. Donnie, what's on the menu today? All right, so uh, looking at our uh, OTVI, OTRI, right here on our, uh, our chart here that we got brought up, OTRI has dropped below, five, or dropped below 6% finally. Uh, so here we, we've been on a constant uh, kind of decline here. Uh, the freight market still, looks, there's plenty of freight still in the market. So we got our OTVI at 12,400. But again, with the, with the split between contracted rates being so much higher than spot rates, a lot of people are just falling back and taking their contracted freight, Thomas. Do you feel like we're starting to reach an inflection point where uh, customers are gonna take that extra and move it to spot? Or have we seen any movement yet downwards on contract? Uh, we've seen a little bit. Let's pop over to our next chart here. Let's kind of take a look at it here. Uh, so uh, these are the rejection rates. Uh, I got it coming up here. I think it's next, but um, we are seeing contracted rates. They, they, they started to dip down just a little bit as well. <clears throat> we believe this is the beginning of it where it's going to continue on to go down. We're kind of in that area right now, August, September. It's, it's, it's a time that the markets can really soften up. 
and there's not a lot of strength in there to, to help carriers rebound during this time. The next upcoming event that's really gonna help carriers out is the fourth quarter rush. And now how strong is that gonna be? We, we know that a lot of uh, our retailers are overstocked. That still has to move though from the warehouses to the stores. So there is freight to move, uh, but we, we gotta keep an eye on this and see, you know, how's it going to increase the strength, you know, of, of the carriers uh, ability to negotiate rates. Right now, our PPI is down to 40. Everything is turning into the shipper's direction right now. And you just hang on. What's our final chart here that we're looking at while we have a minute? Let's go uh, the next one here right quick. This right here is our uh, F <clears throat> NTI, which is down to 242, or down to, uh, it's bounced back up to $2. And I'm comparing this to our contracted rates, the initial, which is at 242. So we see a 42 cent difference right now between our contract and our spot. Uh, we've seen the, the contract start to, to move back down here just a little bit. We had the, uh, the spot rates rebound. Of course, it's, it's, this is a Thursday. We're headed into the weekend. We see it strengthen up normally on a Thursday and Friday, uh, but we're expecting this to, to trend back down as well. The overall trend in the NTI is, is, is also trending down. We are back to 2019 rates. Good Lord, I feel like our next sponsor needs to be seatbelts because we're going to have to buckle up. Speaking of buckling up and get ready, we're going to toss it over to the wall to Miss Sydney Edwards for our first look at headlines. Checking in on headlines this Friday morning, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, diesel consumers have enjoyed several weeks straight of declining diesel prices, but the most recent International Energy Agency report could be cause for concern. The organization releases a monthly report of cost tables and commentary, and this month's report was bullish on the direction of diesel after it soared for three consecutive days in futures markets. Ultra low sulfur diesel on the CME Commodity Exchange climbed back this week with gains of 15 cents, 7.65 cents, and 7.3 cents to settle at $3.40 cents per gallon and did so without any apparent news to drive the sale. Now, however, natural gas has tightened in Europe and that may be just one missing piece to causing this rise. Now, the Federal Maritime Commission is asking for public comment on the need for a 60-day emergency port congestion order that would force carriers and terminals to directly share cargo availability data with shippers, railroads, and drayage truckers. The information received from public comment will help the FMC decide whether an emergency situation exists, and this power was granted to the FMC from the Ocean Shipping Reform Act passed earlier this summer. Now, the FMC said that while congestion at, on the West Coast has loosened up, the backlogs have moved to other ports across the United States and the total congestion metrics remain higher than pre-pandemic levels. And DAT and Convoy are in a legal spat over competing load board technologies. DAT alleging Convoy took trade secrets to build out its own competing load board. Convoy used to be a DAT customer, but now operates its own load board after ending a contract last year. Convoy is calling DAT a monopolist that prevents broker customers, like Convoy, with a choice to either accept the status quo or lose a critical capacity source. And Convoy denies the allegations of misappropriated data and secrets. Both sides are asking for monetary damages and those could be decided in court if it makes it to trial. Now you can find these details to stories and so much more at FreightWaves.com and of course on our FreightWaves app. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. After this break, we'll have social roundabout and economy lately. So stay tuned.
This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet, built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We're welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Welcome back to Freight Waves now on this Friday morning, looking at the potential for a tropical system to develop off of the Gulf Coast this morning, as we've seen several days of continued rainfall across the Gulf Coast kind of just hanging out. But now it's actually starting to get a little bit of organization around it, and essential circulation could be coming within the next day or so. So let's check that out in Sonar Critical Events. So far, we've had three straight days of coastal flood advisories issued by the National Weather Service from New Orleans up through Mobile, out eastward towards Pensacola, the Florida Panhandle, and then eventually towards the Big Bend of Florida. But it's been just kind of disorganized individual thunderstorms so far. Right now, though, the National Hurricane Center has built this now center of, not even a center of circulation yet, just this area of low pressure that's been con constantly formed by these storms as having a low potential chance of tropical development. This low potential chance is still sitting at about 20 to 25 percent. That's a development within the next three days. So we do have the chance for it to ramp up a little bit, but it's still looking fairly disorganized. What we would need for this to become an actual tropical system is to see the center kind of clear out and see a true counterclockwise circulation around that area of low pressure. However, though, this doesn't mean that the rain threat is not there for folks in Mobile and then eastward through uh, the Panhandle of Florida and then the Port of New Orleans. We've been seeing a ton of rain over the last few days. Mobile and Gulf Gulfport actually set their single day rainfall record yesterday record that stood at 3.99 inches that had stood since the early 1900s broken at over four inches of rainfall within a 24-hour period so it has been quite soggy there and we are seeing some flooding issues not only just from the rain but also from some inland storm surge and some high tides with all of this uh, thunderstorm activity as well we're going to keep an eye on it to see if it actually does develop into a potential tropical system. If it does so and has the chance to become, become a tropical storm, it would be Tropical Storm Danielle, but that is way far out in the future for now. We will talk more weather coming up later on in the show. Right now, we're going to head over to check out what is trending on social media. Good morning, everyone, and welcome into the Social Roundabout. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and like Kaylee said, we take a look at what's trending on social media in this segment. And for those who don't know, the ocean can be a pretty terrifying place. I'm going to let you in on a secret. That's how cargo ships get from, get from country to country. Uh, take a look at this video of some cargo ships that, caught, caught, that got caught in some pretty powerful storms in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, that's going to be a big no for me, dog. Uh, switching things up a little bit, we're going to talk about some more food news. We you know last Wednesday, or this past Wednesday, we talked about Sonic bringing back their pickle slush. Well, now Doritos is trying to one-up them. They're bringing in some flavors from Canada, one of those being my least favorite condiment, probably the worst condiment that's ever been made. 
that's ketchup. So this, <laughs> they're gonna also have a mustard flavor. Now the ketchup flavor is going to be one that's not exactly, it doesn't taste the same as the one that's in Canada. They did say it's going to be a slight different taste from that actual one that they have in Canada. But now their mustard bottle, their mustard chips are actually going to be based on Chinese hot mustard. So it's gonna have a little bit of a spicy taste, which those might be pretty good. Now the ketchup ones, like I said, if you're eating those, you're, I don't even know what to tell you at this point, because like I said, ketchup is just a bottom tier condiment. So grow up, taste buds. Um, that's all I have for this edition of Social Roundabout. But now we're gonna take a look at the funniest segment in freight, Economy Lately. Hello and welcome back to The Kind Lately. I'm Anthony Smith, specifically Anthony313, and I'm here with South Turk, specifically South 12-4, and we are doing economy lately. It's a bit yeah. of a shift, but it's all fine. Everything's yeah. fine. Yeah. No one's gonna find us here. Yeah. So where did we leave off last week in the other dimension? I think it was something around employment. Shh, don't say that. Right, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. We're back where we always were. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. We were talking about employment South, and we're talking about we need to see if there's going to be any changes in the employment numbers and that's going to show something along the lines of if fewer people are working more jobs, a sign that they need more money or something like that. But that's exactly what we got. We saw the latest number for the unemployment number and that dipped down to 3.5. And now this hasn't been that low since COVID went on its 2020 world tour. And now what we're seeing in the employment market is that a lot of folks are saying that it's robust and stronger than ever. But there's some details that we got to jump into, starting off with the payrolls number. And so in the payrolls number, we got a pretty strong seemingly result showing that over 520,000 jobs were added. Now the payroll number essentially shows how many people got employed or how many people added jobs to the labor force. So there are now over 520,000 individuals that have secured jobs. That's great. But the thing is, is that the participation rate ticked down a tenth of a percent. So that shows that the composition is a little bit different than that 3.5% that we had before the pandemic started. That 3.5% was composed of more actual workers. But when we see a participation rate, participation rate, participation rate, there it is, go down, that shows that there are actually fewer people working. The other big aspect that we have to talk to with the payrolls going up means that potentially that more people are getting second jobs or part-time jobs. When we look into the report, we see that over 300,000 of those payroll jobs were part-time due to economic reasons. Now that's also concerning because potentially these individuals would want full-time jobs but weren't able to secure them or have been bumped down to part-time. So this is all kind of shifting some of the dynamics that we're seeing within the labor market. The other big thing that we also saw that productivity dropped for the second quarter and is down now 2.5% on a year-over-year -year basis. This is the lowest drop or the lowest level that we've seen since the series of the report and that's been going on since the 1940s. All in all, there are some bright spots that we'll kind of try to get to with inflationary pressure starting to somewhat flatten, potentially temporarily. We'll get into that a little bit later, but right now what we're seeing is that consumers are still on some rocky grounds. We're seeing that the credit card utilization rate is increasing and it has increased and is now, of course, at all time highs. So when we're seeing that inflationary pressure is still very much present, that more people are working potentially second jobs, that the participation rate is lower, it's all cause for concern. The other big story that we got throughout the week was of course from the CPI, the Consumer Purchasing Index, and that showed that there was no change. And this was cause for celebration for a lot of individuals. I mean, a lot of folks saw this as potentially peak inflation being here. And I think this is a great thing to see that there's some subsiding potential year over year trends happening for the inflationary levels for the consumer. And that's really cool. One of the big things, though, from this report really showed that the only significant mover was from energy. Now, really with gas coming down around 7.7% 7, 7 on a month-to-month -month basis. This is good because, of course, you want to see more dollars being spent for Americans that don't have to go to essential goods and living essentials, things like that. But it doesn't quite mean that inflation is just gone. It just shows that there was a sideways movement. And it's very telling when a lot of folks are just happy that, hey, it just didn't get worse. That kind of shows what kind of position that we're in. 
Now, it's not too surprising that we saw an easing in the gas prices, but when we're looking at diesel, this might be short-lived. Now, there was an article that got put out by Rachel Premack and our very own John Kingston as well, who featured in that article, and that shows that there's potentially some more rising pressures for energy prices, especially as we get into the core energy usage months in the winter throughout the remainder of 2022. So good celebration here, but might be a little bit early when we're looking at diesel at least. All in all, this week has been somewhat of a mixed bag in terms of economic releases, but there are some underlying trends as we mentioned earlier to kind of be noteful of. That's gonna be, of course, around the participation rate coming down and not being at where it was pre-pandemic. So really the 3.5% unemployment rate doesn't really quite hold the same way it did before the pandemic. The other big thing, of course, being the composition of those non-farm job roles or non-farm payrolls, I should say, that were added. That doesn't quite add up because it's gonna be more part-time jobs potentially. The other big thing that we have to take note of is that the downward movement came from gas prices, which is a great relief point, but other areas of the CPI and PPI are still very much elevated and continue to increase. I'll take the wins when we can, but the Fed is going to use the low unemployment numbers as a fuel, in a sense, to continue to increase interest rates because they're going to need to use something at the back half of this recession to use for quantitative easing. and a tool to essentially lower some of those interest rates to kind of spur more actual consumption potentially in the economy. So they're using this now so they can really be able to use this later to combat the ongoing slowdowns that we're going to likely see in the latter half of 2022 and going into 2023. We're looking at whether we're in a recession or not. I only care about it because it's being brought up so much. The GDP could go up in the third and fourth quarter could really imagine it doing that. But even if it did, I would still classify the first half of 2022 as a recession just because it's classically two quarters back to back declining. Next week is going to be like Christmas in August or kind of like that. We have a lot of great releases that's going to be updated, starting with housing starts, which is going to be great. Industrial production and South You Know Fulfill is going to have ties to Fotry. Had to mention it real quick. And of course, retail sales. All those and much more are going to be released in this upcoming week, and we'll dive into those trends on the next episode of Economy Lately. This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet, built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We are welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience.
Welcome back to the second carrier update uh, brought to you by Uptake. I'm Thomas Watson. Joining me again is Mr. Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, we have a map. What does it say, sir? It says, uh, it says there's no change. So I brought up our WRI map. Our WRI looks at um, our, the weighted rejection rate. It's, it's, it's basically showing us what markets are changing from week to week. The significant change. We want to see the markets that are uh, either above a 4.0 or below a negative 4.0. And what we're seeing today is a map that's mainly just no color. It's pretty bland. It's pretty bland. And that's because right now there's not a lot of significant change going on in these markets. You see a little bit of red in Ontario and LAX. Not a lot. You know, rejection rates are so low there because uh, a lot of people have fallen back to their contracted freight in California already uh, because of the taking advantage of the fuel surcharge with the higher contract rates. It helps out because fuel prices are so high in California. Uh, Houston, a little, a light shade of a red there. We do see a little bit of blue. We got one market that's a little bit of blue, and that's Baltimore. And we'll look at that here in just a little bit, just to kind of, out of curiosity, see why it's blue. But basically what this is telling us is there's not a lot of change going on. And we're seeing that, you know, there is declines in the uh, in rejection rates, but they're very falling very slowly. It looks like we are definitely in the summer doldrums. What are we looking at on our next chart? Yep, here? let's go to the next chart here. Uh, so this is, since there's not a lot of change going on, this is probably a really good map that carriers need to fall back on and keep a very close eye on. This is our head haul index with volumes uh, behind it. So red means they're underbooked. There's more trucks than freight in those markets. Blue means they're overbooked. There's more freight than there is trucks. So in times like this right now when things are getting... Uh, deteriorating, it's, it's probably best to keep your trucks in the markets that are blue, head to the blue. Uh, and that's gonna help you keep your truck rolling. It doesn't mean that rates are gonna be a lot better in those markets, it's just you have a better opportunity to get freight to keep your trucks rolling. LAX, Dallas, Memphis, Atlanta, uh, Harrisburg, <clears throat> Indianapolis, Columbus, Chicago. These are all strong markets you probably wanna aim your truck towards. Now, let's pop in here and look and see why Boston is blue. Over the past few days here in Boston, we have seen both a rise in volumes up to 106 from 92, which has probably helped tighten that market up and rejection rates have pushed up <clears throat> from just above 5% up to 10.84%. So this is definitely a market to keep your eye on. It is a port market as well, uh, just to see if, if rates out of this market start to increase. Start to be checking it out. The East Coast is becoming the new West Coast. Thank you so much, yes. Donnie. But we're going to toss it back over to uh, Kaylee and Anthony for our next interview. All right, guys, thank you for that update. We'll talk to you guys a little bit more coming up in just a few minutes. Right now, we're going to welcome the armchair attorney, Matthew Leffler, to the show. And Matt, you're here with us, and you're participating in Fun Shirt Friday. I've got to say, I like the shirt. <laughs> We got to get ready to relax. The weekend is upon us. I'm excited. Thank you for having me here. And so let's dig into the topic at hand, a little bit about what's going on with the Supreme Court decision with C.H. Robinson, kind of the warning flags that it's throwing up to the industry. First thing, kind of give us an overview about the case and then the decision that was made. Let me just say, I love Ryan Schreiber, but he had an article recently. I want to talk a little bit about this C.H. Robinson case. This is all about potential broker liability for the negligent or alleged negligent hiring of a carrier. The facts of this case are really sad. Costco hired C.H. Robinson to go move some freight. C.H. Robinson hired a company called RT Service. The driver for RT Service lost control of his vehicle, crossed the center line, collided head on with the person who was ultimately injured and became a quadriplegic. That, that that plaintiff then sued uh, to try and get some compensation from C.H. Robinson, among others. And at the district level, the lowest court, he actually lost. And they went to the, the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Ninth Circuit said, actually, there is a path for you to recover. The This act that we're talking about, the Federal Aviation Authorization Act, or F-A-A-A-A, -A -A -A, uh, doesn't actually prohibit you from making those claims. That was then brought to the Supreme Court. They asked for the Supreme Court to take a look at it. They do the thing called the writ for certiorari. And the Supreme Court didn't respond. They denied the writ for certiorari, and there's a lot of reasons we'll get into, but that is, at its core, the foundations of this case. Are brokers potentially liable for the alleged negligent hiring of their driver partners? And Matthew, when you look at this case, do you see this potentially kind of setting a precedent potentially for other cases outside of this transaction? 
That's the real question. So one of the reasons why the Supreme Court would hear a case is whether or not it's been a, a dispute among the different circuits. And this is a case we call a first impression, meaning no one's ever brought a claim about wrongful hiring under the this particular part of the statute, which is uh, this 14501C, which is the preemption that covers price, route, and service. The, the act itself has this carve out for safety regulations, and that's what the Supreme Court likely was thinking about. In terms of what will happen next, uh, there will be more litigation. Uh, this is not new. I want to be very clear here. The idea that you can go after a broker for negligently hiring a carrier is not a new phenomenon. This is why the Supreme Court didn't jump in and say, we have to settle this dispute. These cases will continue to happen. And this is something for brokers. And Ryan does a great job in his article telling you, you should be talking to your attorneys now, understanding what potential liability you have as you look to vet your carrier partners. So obviously, when it comes to carrier vetting, a lot of that onus is on the individual broker itself, but there's only so much that they can do, right? If you've got a carrier who is maybe, let's let's use a mid-sized carrier, they've got a good reputation, maybe not a great reputation. They've had a couple of issues, but nothing that's major. Your gut is going to say, you know what, I think I trust them, let's go with them. And you can't necessarily rely on a full reputation, right? A driver could be having a bad day. It could just be this kind of one-off situation. And a lot of that falls back on the broker, but at the same time, it doesn't. So should this be looked at as kind of a case-by-case -case basis instead of maybe setting precedent? Because at the end of the day, like, we're all human, right? Like, drivers have a bad day. I know I have bad days. Anthony probably has bad days, but I doubt it. But, like, it's it happens, right? Not everybody's going to be perfect 100% of the time. You're 100% right. This is about a case-by-case -case basis because it's about negligence, ultimately, is what is your duty to do a certain activity when you're hiring a company? So you have to have processes. You have to have technology partners that can help you figure out, is this carrier the one they purport to be? And at the end of the day, the thing to keep in mind is FMCSA, the safety regulations, these are minimum standards of our industry. States have every right, and they do include higher levels of uh, regulatory safety statutes or safety common law. So if you're trying to avoid liability and to understand what you're up against, you want to make sure your carriers have adequate insurance. You want to make sure that you're talking and verifying all the different aspects of their business. And if you can, get references. But again, none of this is meant as legal advice. If you're a broker and you're trying to understand your liability, talk to attorneys in your state because these are state-specific things. As of right now, the FAAA does not prohibit or exempt you from a liability under this uh, this preemption doctrine. It is the safety things are still going to be there. These claims will still be there. And if the different circuits over the next few years adopt different positions on this statute, then we might go to the Supreme Court. But I think we're not going to have SCOTUS. They're not going to help us. They're not going to save us in this case. You have to be proactive in how you vet your carriers. I think one of the things you mentioned, of course, was insurance costs. Would this potentially start to impact depending on how it plays out, insurance costs for brokers and ultimately shippers? Absolutely. Uh, so a couple of things to note, like we have this thing called the nuclear verdict. That is a pretend legal term. It's not a legal term. Um, the DOT actually has a number for the valuation of human life at $11.2 million. A nuclear verdict means a case that's over $10 million. Anytime someone dies or has a catastrophic injury, it will be over $10 million, probably. And so what we look at is terms like the insurance piece of this. And this is why the states have these regulatory regimes. This carrier, the RT service that, uh, that made it someone a quadriplegic, my guess is they don't have the insurance to cover all of those things. And so as a plaintiff, you're looking and saying, well, who has pockets? Who can I go after? Who has the ability to make me whole? And these brokers are usually the ones that have insulated themselves from liability. But I think that they will see an increase in their insurance rates. And maybe as time goes on, the FMCSA may come out and say, we demand carriers to have higher levels of coverage. And if the higher level of coverage is something, that will also increase your overall cost of insurance. With that cost of insurance, obviously it impacts those smaller to mid-sized carriers more than it does those really large fleets. But sometimes often, as we were talking about earlier this week, those larger fleets are the ones that can kind of skirt underneath the regulations where they don't have drivers who are completely vetted or completely trained because there are just so many people involved in their organization. So how do we find that balance if it exists between putting the onus on the broker on the larger carrier and also not making it so expensive with just blanket rates for the entire, I guess, kind of carrier network or carrier ethos that it runs those little guys who can't afford it out of business? 
This is a great question. This is one of the hallmarks, and the, and the case actually talks a little bit about deregulation for the 1980s. Uh, this is a big challenge of the industry. So if you're a big carrier, you may even self-insure up to a certain dollar amount. So you don't even care if it's under $5 million because you're going to pay that out of pocket. You have the margins to support that. For the small carriers, their, their limits, their, what they're supposed to carry minimum in some cases, is $750,000. That's barely enough to handle someone who breaks an arm or a leg in the modern world of medical uh, you know, cases when you go to the hospital. So I don't know the answer to this. I think what we're going to find is at the end of the day, states want to make sure that if somebody in some chain of custody of some deal is responsible for some catastrophic accident, it shouldn't be the taxpayers in the state that have to take up that burden through emergency services or other types of ways of forgiving medical debt. In our country, the biggest form of bankruptcy is medical debt. So this is a really big issue. I don't know the answer. I think for small carriers, you're nimble and you're able to compete at a lower rate in some cases, but that may change as insurance changes in how we look at liability for carriers and for brokers. So Matt, last question for you, and this is going to pick on lawyers a little bit, but not specifically your type of lawyer. I'm thinking of the lawyers who come through and, you know, they're the commercials that you see that say, if you've been injured in a motor vehicle accident by an 18 wheeler, like I'm going to fight for your money, right? Where do they sit in these types of situations like this? Are they continually oh, just... I love, <laughs> I love this question. I love this question. They are brokers. So when you have a TV commercial lawyer, maybe, maybe they're going to litigate that case. But reality is you call them and then they say, I'm taking in you as a client and I'm going to refer you to somebody else. And they get typically one third of that attorney's one third. So in the law business, we broker all the time. So for these guys that are out there uh, doing this uh, commercial and everything, that, that's kind of what they do. But at the end of the day, most people who are in a catastrophic accident do not know who to call. They don't know what they're supposed to do because you don't plan for catastrophic events. And so a plaintiff's attorney is somebody who's designed and trained and, and practices in going after people that are well more funded than you. And keep in mind, as a plaintiff attorney, you do not get paid unless you win something. So if you go to court and you lose, you don't get anything except for maybe the court costs. Like maybe your client will pay for the filing fees. So it's a really interesting business as a plaintiff's attorney. For the defense attorneys, the same kind of thing happens. They're generally representing insurance companies. Now, occasionally they work with the company directly and they, and they will as a client, but they're working with the insurers who are having to pay out these massive amounts of money. And medical... Uh, transactions. These are expensive things. When you get really injured, it's not cheap. It can be $50,000 a day in a hospital. So the lawyers out there, um, I love them. I love Ryan Schreiber. He's a good dude. I think what he's doing at Metaphor is amazing. Uh, but I think with his article and talking about C.H. Robinson changing the way the business works, I don't think it's that way. I think this is just showing us and reminding us what the stakes actually are in our industry. I think you're excellent as always. Thank you so much for being here and breaking down the situation. We look forward to having you on again. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, guys. Great to see you both. All right, guys, take care. And of course, you can find Matt on LinkedIn, the armchair attorney, for more non official, non solicited legal advice. Right now, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back in just a few minutes. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now.
Welcome back to Freight Waves Now. It's time for our second check of the weather this morning. And it's quiet across this desert southwest right now, but we're watching for another pretty hefty day of monsoon activity coming up for your Friday and into the start of your Saturday as well. So let's check that out in sonar critical events. Right now, we've got the National Weather Service that has issued flood watches across the majority of New Mexico and into Arizona. Once again, they're kind of centered over the areas that have seen that really increased wildfire activity so far this year specifically over the Gila National Forest where the Black Fire was burning. This fire burned over 300,000 acres and it ended up being the second largest wildfire in New Mexico history. It has been completely put out thanks to all this rain, but there has been some very substantial mudslides and landslides due to that rain falling over the burn scar. With that, those flood watches extend all the way through Arizona, I-17 between Flagstaff and Phoenix, and then along the I-40 corridor, basically from the Arizona-New Mexico border all the way westward into the southern parts of California. We're also seeing some potential for some heavy rainfall once again in the Vegas metro. They underwent some flooding last week that closed some of those roadways out there and closed some of the roads within the city itself and some of those interstates out there. Same thing goes moving up northward into Utah, that I-15 corridor all the way up to Salt Lake. We could be seeing flooding potential for today and into tomorrow. The Salt Lake City Metro actually getting some much needed rain. They've been very, very dry so far this season, and they've actually been underneath some fire weather warnings here for the last few weeks. So the rain that's falling there is very beneficial for not only the city itself, but also for the water basins around those areas. Total rainfall from today's storms could once again exceed about an inch and a half to two inches in some places. Nothing to cause extreme flooding like what we saw last week across Death Valley, but still enough where you got that runoff on that dry soil where it could cause some problems, especially on those low-lying roads. We'll talk more weather coming up in our second hour. Right now, we're going to head back over to Isaiah Buchanan. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan. And in this segment, we take a look at what's trending on social media. And the ocean can be a very scary place, especially if you're having to travel through a storm. Take a look at this video of a container ship and the storms that they had to pass through. That video has my thalassophobia acting up, so that's going to be a no from me, dog. Switching things up a little bit, earlier this week we talked about how Sonic is bringing back their pickle juice slush. Well, I think Doritos is now trying to one-up them on flavors that nobody asked for. They, Doritos has a flavor in Canada that is a ketchup flavor that they're now making available to everyone here in the U.S. So this ketchup flavor is, so it origi originated in Canada but the one that's going to be for sale here in the U.S. is going to be slightly different. They're also going to have a mustard flavor. Now, this mustard flavor is going to be based on Chinese hot mustard, so it's going to be kind of a spicy kick to it. Now, those might be okay. I would try those, but the ketchup flavor, no way. You couldn't pay me to eat those because ketchup is a bottom-tier condiment. I would not do it at all. Couldn't pay me to do it. Take a look at This is one of the reasons why right here, why I absolutely cannot stand ketchup. Look at this video. every time not to mention that like ketchup just has a, it's kind of bland when you think about it like barbecue sauce is better ranch is better honey mustard is better come on people put the ketchup away anthony smith don't eat it with your fries anymore let's grow up and eat some better condiments you know all right that's all i've got for this edition of social roundabout but now we're going to take a look at the last 24 hours in freight with our market update
This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet. Built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We are welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience. Welcome back to the second hour of Freight Waves Now, the third carrier update. And there's two of us. I'm Thomas Watson. Joining me is Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, we got some more maps here, but I'm digging the vibes here. This one actually has some color to it. What are we looking yeah. at? So uh, we're going to jump into some reefer here on the second hour. Uh, this is our one week change uh, for reefer outbound tender rejection rates. So we can come in and look at it and see what's different this week than what it was last week. And we've actually got a little bit of color. The, the south down here is cooling down a little bit. The Jacksonville Savannah markets for reefer freight, uh, or the rejection rates have lowered. I want to say it's cooling down. But here at Atlanta, they've, they've increased slightly. Uh, and again, kind of the same way with reefer as we are uh, getting in. You know, reefer's a, a more of a niche market, so you don't see, um, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot tougher to run a reefer truck than it is. Uh, your drive-in trucks because there's just not as much reefer freight as there's drive-in freight. So you're going to have things like uh, higher deadhead miles on average uh, just because you have, you have to travel further from shipper to shipper to, to keep your truck running. And again, right now as things soften up, it's probably best to try to keep your truck in these major metro areas. You see here, uh, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth, Atlanta. Uh, Florida is never a good market except for those few months in the produce season, which we've already pass for Florida. But up through the Midwest here, this is kind of our poultry belt and running in these areas and, and keep running towards the blue to keep your truck, keep your drivers happy. The drivers aren't moving, they're gonna start quitting, you have higher layover or driver turnover and that could really be a problem for you. It also runs the risk of, uh, like you said, you're chasing smaller reefer freight, but the reefer can also run dry van under 42,000 pounds preferably. Yes. Uh, so we may see that in the, some of these markets, like you said, they may be cannibalizing from the dry van carriers because you still got to put something in that trailer. Yeah. So when you, when you go to your market dashboard, I always say if you're reefer, click it on reefer, but also check those rates for dry van. You can simply go and cut that reefer off. And some shippers will allow uh, to load a reefer, but I'll, many of them won't. Exactly. We yeah. won't cut any reefer off here. What is our yeah. next chart again? Uh, let's jump in here. The next chart, we're going to look at the, the reefer head haul index. This is the run to the blue. A little bit different here, but you see again your major metros that are sticking up here. Uh, Juliet, which we'll, we'll, we'll run some lanes out of Juliet here uh, on our next uh, session here. Uh, but you see, you know, Fort Worth sticking up, and these are the these are the markets in blue are the ones that are overbooked for reefer, reefer freight. These are the ones that you want to kind of keep your truck probably a lot in this area, unless you want to run coast to coast. I like it, Donnie. Thank you so much. Here at Freight Waves, we don't run the jewels, but we prefer to run the blues. So make sure that you're paying attention to those blue markets and the money will follow. That's it for this carry update, though. We're going to toss it back over to Kaylee and Anthony for our next interview. Hi, guys. Thank you for that. Right now, we're going to welcome Alan Adler, our Detroit Bureau Chief, and of course, our lead writer of Truck Tech. Alan, what's going on? We just talked to you yesterday about what's going on with Trevor Milton and Nicola, but now we're taking our little technical sideline for our Friday. What's up in today's newsletter? Okay. So, in interestingly enough, this week, we've got something new in the infrastructure space uh, for electric charging. This is a, a big deal. Um, truck charging really does trail what's happening with... Um, uh, passenger car charging. There's more of that going in. The federal government has set aside, you know, $5 billion, maybe seven and a half billion for essentially infrastructure charging, but not any of that is broken out or earmarked for 
truck charging. So what this announcement this week from a company called Volterra, which is kind of a cute name, I'll get to that in a moment, um, is proposing is to spend over a billion dollars. They've got a Stockholm-based investor uh, that is putting the money in, and they're actually a spin-out of a company uh, called um, – uh, oh, gosh, I'm going to forget the name for the moment. But there's been a company that is basically does data centers and has done a lot of work on the reliability of data centers. They felt like uh, for the last year, this company that is now known as Volterra was operating uh, within that company, kind of in stealth mode and pulling together a staff of experienced people in electrification. So we're talking another truck as a service, uh, excuse me, charging as a service business um, with Volterra, but it looks like it could be um, something, again, with having good funding behind it, it could make a difference uh, in terms of getting uh, structure out there for, for to support uh, electric trucks. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is that, you know, we're trailing behind what we're seeing in passenger cars and things like that which could be a gift and a curse. We can see what works there, and but we're still a little bit behind. Are there any other trends that you're seeing in the passenger car space that you would hope to see kind of transfer over to um, autonomous driving, or I'm sorry, the electrification of trucks here? Well, I, Anthony, I think, you know, as long as the high-speed direct uh, current charging is going in, and this is going to allow charging in, in minutes rather than hours, um, there is some application for trucks, especially the smaller uh, smaller, uh, medium duty delivery vehicles, things like that. But, you know, the, the uh, amount of batteries and heavy duty trucks is, is so, so heavy that it takes longer to charge. And so ultimately we're going to be waiting for, you know, megawatt charging, uh, which will allow for, uh, you know, this is years away, quite honestly, um, it, that'll allow for us to, to really charge, uh, electric trucks at a, at a brisk enough clip to make them, you know, uh, viable to be on the road. Because really, if you have to take even 45 minutes to charge, that's lost time from from uh, uptime. And so, you know, that's sort of the goal here. But I think with, um, with what we're seeing in some of the activity out there, you know, pilot companies and General Motors just announced a uh, nationwide rollout of, you know, uh, uh, 500 locations for uh, charging. Uh, that's mostly aimed at the light duty market. There could be some application for for heavy duty. Uh, one to watch, of course, is the Daimler truck and BlackRock and uh, a, another uh, uh, energy organization are working together on a $650 million uh, truck, medium and heavy duty truck charging. So there, there is th there are green shoots coming up. And, uh, you know, we also understand, I talked to uh, Britta Gross this week. Britta is a former colleague of mine at General Motors who, who is now at the uh, Electric Power Research Institute. And she said that there is talk now and even an acronym associated with a program to um, – federally fund uh, electric truck charging. So uh, we'll see how that develops. But it's going to take sort of the three-legged stool of industry and, uh, you know, a private equity and government to get us to the point of having what we need for uh, electric truck charging to, to really make it uh, scalable. Alan, obviously the scale that which we would need for electric charging to be a viable option for medium duty and long haul trucking is massive, right? And as you mentioned, it takes that three pronged approach, three pronged approach to make it even just a viable option to talk about. Right now, it seems like there are so many different players trying to do so many different things in this space. So I'm wondering if we get to a point where we see a massive consolidation and see everybody kind of take on one specific approach, or are we really far from that just because we need to get it off the ground running and we're at the time where it's just any approach is a viable approach right now? Well, Kayla, I think right now the, the, the pool is big. There's plenty of room for people to get in. Ultimately, you're going to have the same shakeout that you're seeing in, in other parts of transportation technologies. You know, you, you've already seen it with uh, Romeo Battery merging with Nikola, for example, uh, because they couldn't make it themselves. You've seen a couple other, you know, face plants that, that are out there that are really sad. You've seen, you know, late lifeline like Walmart agreeing to buy a bunch of vehicles from Canoe, which is going to keep them going at least for a while. So I think you're going to have winners and losers like you do in everything. But for right now, um, as Britta Gross put it to me, it's getting kind of crowded out there. But that's not a bad thing because, you know, until you see who's got the money to do this work, who has the contacts. And one of the things about Volterra that I think makes them one to watch is that they've got in, in their CEO, 
Matt Horton. They've got a guy who comes out of Rivian, who ran the electrification, uh, you know, charging business there. And then also prior to that, he was at Proterra as the chief commercial officer and was involved in a lot of their expansion into infrastructure. So, um, you know, these guys uh, look like they might have the right people and the right expertise to get something done. Um, they're not going to be in the hardware business. They're not going to make chargers. They'll buy them. Uh, you know, there's lots of places to get those. Um, but this whole idea of, you know, getting sites prepared and things like that, that's work that most fleets don't want anything to do with. So they want someone to do it for them. And I think those that do the best job of, of you know, smoothing that over, and, and that even can be a utility itself. I, I have in the, in the newsletter today, we reference a, 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 a a business that Duke Energy has started for sort of uh, charging as a service um, uh, in their non-public utility side. So it's cropping up, as you said, everywhere. I think the idea is that it'll have to ultimately will be a shakeout. But for right now, it's probably good to have as many as you can. Well, I'm excited to dive into this headline item in your upcoming newsletter. Uh, are there any other topics that you're going to be highlighting here? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I make fun of them. I and I know that you know it's not always the right thing to do. But Tesla said this week, actually, Elon Musk said this week, not Tesla. They don't talk. But Elon Musk said this week that the Tesla Semi is coming and it will go into uh, it, it'll be for sale this year, which is news in the sense that the last uh, estimate we had from them was late 2023. Um, we don't know how many. We don't know uh, honestly whether it's going to actually happen. But but he did tweet it this week, um, and you know how much he loves. Twitter. So I, I think I think you know that's a that's worth noting. Also some some interesting stuff on Wabash expanding their um, uh, sort of sort of they call it uh, Econex, uh, which is a uh, a material that they're using in place of you know aluminum and and steel in in trailer making and for. Uh, you know, last mile. Uh, this is something that they're looking at for their refrigerated vehicles. So a little bit of that. And, and of course, I can't remember if I brought it up yesterday on, on the Nikola segment or not, but uh, uh, we do have a little bit of uh, things just keep getting worse for Trevor out there uh, at the at the bottom of the newsletter. So there's, there's a fair amount in there. And and I do think, uh, especially the stuff from Britta Gross about about what's happening on the, on the uh, charging side is interesting reading. Absolutely, Alan. We talked a little bit about Nicola and Trevor Milton yesterday. Really qu quickly, before we let you go, Rivian earnings dropped yesterday. Anything that came out of the earnings call that surprised you or anything that you think was right on par with where they were expecting to go? Uh, are you talking, I'm sorry, you said Rivian? Because yep. I'm, I don't really I don't really follow them closely. Brian Strait does a little bit. Um, and uh, I was not on the call, so I'm afraid I can't help you there. Dang, well, I'll have to ask Brian about it. Well, Alan, thank you for joining us as always today. Great to have you. And, you know, Anthony, you can go to FreightWaves.com, go get subscribed to his Truck Tech newsletter, head up to the top bar, click the newsletters bar, drop it down, and get that newsletter subscription in. i, I got to say, I, I bet that Alan's well over his, his uh, goal. Oh, I'm sure. So I'm sure. And I, like I said, I'm always a little bit jealous because he covers such cool topics, mm -hmm. but... He does the work that we all kind of envy. So, yeah, Alan, thanks for being here this morning. Speaking of cool topics that he covers, uh, you know what's coming up? What's that? The Autonomous and Electric Vehicle Summit coming up in just about a little under a month. That is the Alan Adler Show. So, that you know is. what? Head over to live.freightwaves.com and get registered for it. But we'll talk more about that later. Right now, we're going to go check in with Sydney for a look at our top stories today. With a full report of our headlines this morning, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, the Federal Maritime Commission is asking for public comment on the need for a 60-day emergency port congestion order that would force carriers and terminals to directly share cargo availability data with shippers, railroads, and drage truckers. The information received from public comment will help the FMC decide whether an emergency situation exists. And this power was granted to the FMC from the Ocean Shipping Reform Act passed earlier this summer. The FMC said that while congestion on the West Coast has loosened up, the backlogs have moved to other ports across the United States, and the total congestion metrics remain higher than pre-pandemic levels. And DNT and Convoy are in a legal spat over competing load board technologies, with DAT alleging Convoy took trade secrets to build out its own competing load board. Convoy used to be a DAT customer, but now operates its own load board after ending a contract last year. Convoy is calling DAT a monopolist that prevents broker customers, like Convoy, with the choice to either accept the status quo or lose a critical capacity source. And Convoy denies the allegations of misappropriated data and secrets.
Both sides are asking for monetary damages, and those could be decided in court if it makes it to trial. Air Canada is diving headfirst into a standalone freighter division as the market remains super strong for air cargo. The carrier was one of the first to see the opportunity in transferring cargo to passenger aircraft at the start of the pandemic, and it paid off with the airline now being able to expand, excuse me, expand its dedicated cargo fleet. And the current plan is to convert eight retired Boeing 767 jets into freighters with delivery dates over the next year and a half. Additionally, Air Canada has acquired two factory-built 767s scheduled to enter service in 2023 and has ordered two 777 freighters with delivery expected in 2024. And Daimler Truck reported improved top and bottom lines for the second quarter, but expressed concern for full-year financial results, citing the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Daimler's production plants in Germany could be in trouble if Russia decides to restrict gas imports to the country, which would inhibit finished truck deliveries. In quarter two, those inhibitions led to a negative free cash flow of $781 million. The company also highlighted driver shortage, inflation, and interest rate increases as headwinds for the rest of the year, with the German bank raising interest rates in July for the first time in 11 years. However, the company said it delivered over 120,000 units last quarter and increased its revenue by almost $3 billion. And flexible warehousing tech company Stored announced a new initiative called Stored One Commerce last month. It has allowed for new opportunities like drainage capabilities to enter the network. The new offering also includes cold chain storage through a partnership with Fresh Del Monte, custom packaging capabilities, and e-commerce returns. The company said the additions are to complete a port-to-porch supply chain so brands can manage the whole process of getting goods to consumer hands. Now you can find these details and so much more on our website, FreightWaves.com, and on our FreightWaves app. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. You can get the full FreightWaves TV experience by heading on over to tv.freightwaves.com. We're going to hand this over to Kaylee Nix for a check of our weather now. Thanks, Sydney, for those updates. We'll talk one more time about our top stories of the day. Right now, we're touching once again on the fire danger that's living kind of in the eastern half of Oregon and Washington, as well as the northern parts of California. As temperatures continue to rise, and it still remains very, very dry out there. We're headed into peak fire season right now that typically lasts from the beginning of August through about the middle of October for these folks as they dry out, lose some of that summer rainfall, and that winter snowpack is all gone. With that, we're starting to see more fires start to erupt in the backcountry there some on the small side we've got two larger and almost one classified as a major wildfire burning right now so let's check that out in sonar critical events right now that area in yellow that's highlighted is going to be the place where we see the highest fire danger today this area has shrunk it was well out across the entirety of eastern oregon yesterday and the days before so far crater lake national park as well as the northern kind of northeastern corner of california i would call it involved in those fire conditions today mostly going to be watching the potential for some thunderstorms to pop up, but those thunderstorms won't have a ton of rainfall in them. They're going to be kind of those dry thunderstorms. We'll see the potential for lightning strikes to possibly start some more wildfires out in those areas. Right now, we're still watching the McKinney fire out there. It's burning over 60,000 acres right now, but it is mostly contained. So this is good news is it doesn't look like it's encroaching on that I-5 corridor at all, causing any headaches there. Only problems caused by this fire right now as far as traffic goes could be the potential for some visibility issues with some thick smoke. However, that fire has been responsible for several fatalities, the number up to five now. Other than that, fires burning in the Pacific Northwest. We've got one burning up just outside the Eugene, Oregon area at 3,800 acres. Not one to worry about right now. And a couple burning on the east side of Mount Rainier National Park, the Cow Canyon fire, as well as the Vantage Highway fire. This one is the one that we're going to be watching for the potential to impact that I-90 corridor. Once again, with smoke, it can potentially come close to the roadway as well throughout the next few days. So we're going to be watching this as they continue to be really kind of drought starved out there. No rain in the forecast for anywhere up in the northern parts of California for the next few days. We'll talk about weather one more time before we're done here for the day. Right now, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet, built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We are welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience. Welcome back to Freight Waves. Now on this Friday morning, we're welcoming our managing editor here at Freight Waves, Rachel Premack, to the show. Rachel sat down with an energy executive recently to talk a little bit about decarbonization processes. Rachel, thank you for joining us and talk to us a little bit about who you spoke with and what they're saying about the overall state of decarbonization. Yeah, so I spoke to Melissa Williams at Shell Marine. She's based in Houston. She's worked at Shell for many years. And one big initiative at Shell, and I imagine most uh, fuel companies right now, is to look at alternative ways to either reduce how much uh, fuel a, a ship uses or even look at alternative fuel sources. And it's a complicated issue because you know, these ships, they mostly run on this really thick, tar-like fuel called marine fuel oil, and it's really hard to move away from that. So it's definitely a complicated uh, industry to try to decarbonize, but there, there's a lot of need for it, for sure. Rachel, definitely sounds like there's a lot of variables that go into this. Do you have any idea or were there any talks of a potential timeline on the shift as we start to look to this decarbonization or a change in this industry? Yeah, it's definitely decades and decades away. Uh, so, uh, you know, looking at the ships themselves, they last for 20, 30, 40 years. So one, one potential way to move away from uh, the marine fuel oil is to run ships instead on uh, liquefied natural gas or LNG. The problem is that like, you, you need to build a whole new ship for that. So the ships we're building now, those could use LNG, but we still have so many uh, vessels that are running on the traditional types of fuel. Uh, the other way of looking at this is also running ships on biofuels, but that's, again, something you need to build you know, a whole new ship for. So it's decades away, for sure. 
I think that's something that's really interesting when we talk about decarbonization is kind of this broader conversation about just how entrenched on reliance on petroleum products kind of the human race is as a whole, right? Not only just in powering your ships or powering your trucks or powering your equipment, but it's also in the plastic products that you make to go on your trucks. And it's also in the power that you have for the machinery to make these kinds of things. And so decarbonization isn't just about how we're running, it's about how we're taking those steps to change what we're putting into it as well. Where does that conversation kind of land in the scope of folks goals for decarbonization? Or is that just a goal that is way too far out for people to even think about right now? Yeah, it's, uh, taking a, a different look at that, there's definitely one big you know issue when you bring up, okay, let's stop using this marine fuel oil is that, okay, but this oil comes from the entire refining process. So if we just, if, if ships aren't using that uh, fuel, it's just where does that go? So it's definitely a larger ecosystem of what to do with this with this fuel that is, you know, a byproduct of the refining process. Uh, so it's definitely a larger ecosystem, but you know, trying to explore which parts of this to take apart, I it's definitely a, a, a really challenging task. And it's something that uh, you know, Miss Williams, when I spoke with her, she mentioned this whole thing of where we need a whole ecosystem involved. We need the customers of Shell Marine and the customers' customers and universities and governments and international organizations. It, it's a whole it's a whole process. It's a whole community, I guess you could say, that that has to be involved in this. And Rachel, when you're looking at this, one of the things you mentioned, of course, earlier, that this is going to be like a decade long, decades long process. Um, when you look into, of course, the scope of just being a business, where does financials kind of start to fit in this? Do you see this as a potential headwind as trying to make that transition or something that really can really be pushed aside and really be seen as not too much of a headwind, but really just an ongoing project over the next few years? Yeah, definitely. So one, uh, you know, short term solution to this is actually the, the use of lubricants in in your ships. Uh, you can use these sorts of like fancy lubricant systems to reduce how much fuel your ship is using. And that, you know, obviously that's great for the environment. That's great for your uh, bottom line because you're using less fuel. Fuel is very costly, especially nowadays. Uh, so there's th that, that's one side of things. The other side is that um, it, it is definitely a financial uh, a financial issue when you look at uh, the shipping industry as a whole. They aren't as profitable or they do definitely run on low margins, you know, not in the last few years, but uh, generally speaking, it is a low margin industry. So trying to figure out how to best fund this transition, given the fact that margins can be very low, that's definitely yet another challenge in decarbonizing the entire industry. But I think the fact that the IMO has been so involved in setting these regulations, I think that is definitely a good step forward in uh, at least directing uh, directing uh, these companies into uh, you know a more of a decarbonized type type of environment. I think when we talk about kind of the broad scale reputation of fuel companies like this, like Shell, like Valero, like Exxon, they kind of get a bad rap, right? Especially from the general public. People see them and they think, okay, they're just money hungry environmental destroyers, right? But it's conversations like this one that you are having where it really sheds light that not they're, they're invested in goals to make a better environment overall. So Rachel, can you tell me a little bit about how important it is to have these conversations and to bring them to the public to get everybody to know that it's not just a problem that the fuel industry is ignoring, that they are actually taking steps to try and combat this problem? Yeah, it, it's something that definitely I'm a little skeptical of at first as well. Uh, you know, oh, of course, Shell wants to say that they're doing these sort of like PR friendly environmental type things. Uh, but this is like, the direction where everything is headed. Uh, we, we saw in the last few months, obviously, that we can't just you know switch to electric, switch to biofuels tomorrow because we are still very highly dependent on fossil fuels. But I think it is good to at least you know have the conversation, start exploring that, uh, and you know, in the short term, obviously, companies like Shell are going to be heavily profiting off of fossil fuels and. Uh, these sorts of 
these sorts of, uh, you know, fuels that are not particularly great for the environment. But it, it is a process. It is, like we've been talking about, it is a decades long process. And I think it's good that they are, you know, at least taking that first step and really exploring different ways to, to make this happen. Rachel, of course, we're here talking about, I you know, the conversation that you had with this executive, but shifting gears here, but sticking to the energy sector, you put out an article not too long ago uh, in collaboration with John Kingston regarding diesel prices. I love the article and I've been pointing to it um, through a lot of my audiences on freightonomics and economy lately. Real quick, can you highlight some of those points there? Yeah, well, thank you, first of all. Uh, the big kind of uh, overarching point that I think uh, John Kingston was making is just this idea that we have such low inventories of fuel right now. And even though prices have been declining for the past six to seven weeks, I forget the exact you know number, but you know, right now fuel prices have been declining, but the fact is that inventory is still really low and we have all these other sorts of trends starting to arise that will probably even draw further on that supply of fuel. You have a brewing, you know, natural gas crisis in Europe where diesel might be used to, uh, diesel would be used in lieu of Russian fuels in Europe. Uh, you have harvest season coming up. You have these turnarounds, scheduled turnarounds and maintenance at uh, various refineries. It's just like a there, there's a whole bunch of things coming on the horizon that will probably push up the price of diesel again. Unfortunately, for you know drivers of you know truck drivers and other other folks in the industrial economy. It's definitely something that we're going to be watching. Rachel, thank you for joining us. Of course, you can find her content up on FreightWaves.com. We're going to take another quick break, and then we'll be right back to get more FreightWaves through. Welcome back to your final carrier update brought to you by Uptake. I'm Thomas Watson, and this is Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, it looks like we've got some lanes going on. What's on the menu here? Yeah, so we're, we're talking about Boston. We saw it uh, popping up in a couple of those uh, maps that we looked at. So let's kind of look in and see what some lanes are. If you're going to get out of Boston, more than likely you want to try to either stay in the Midwest or get to a major metro area. So I went ahead and brought up uh, Baltimore going back to Chicago. Uh, 
we're at drive in, so I've got it turned on the van, hit my search lane, and I turn my MTID on right here so we can kind of compare it to that. Well, of course, leaving the Northeast, get into a major metro in the Midwest, you, you're not gonna get the best rate that you're looking for, but it's still $2.40 a mile. So still a pretty strong rate uh, for these days. Uh, it's a, here almost 40 cents under the NTID, but if you're running, if you're a carrier and you're running out of Baltimore into Chicago, let's hit the uh, double arrows right here and flip it around and we're looking at Chicago coming back to Baltimore and it's $3 and 22 cents a mile. So that's, uh, you know, about 43 cents above the NTID. So uh, you're going to average a, a pretty decent uh, rate on this lane for running uh, full, full turns on this lane. So, and it's also at 704 miles. So this is probably a pretty good lane that you could run and be profitable on running, provided that you timed it right. It's all about timing. And when we're looking at the NTID here, that's kind of like if you're over or under par almost. Do you want to see how you stack up? Correct. Yes. You know, the NTI, this is the, the, the U.S. average. And this is, you know, this is a, a, what we call a tweener haul run, but it's a 700 mile run. It's not a short run. Uh, so here getting this price on this, on this long of a haul is a pretty good run and you're, you're above the average. <clears throat> Let's pop in and look at one more lane out of Baltimore. Let's go Baltimore going to Indianapolis. 596 miles, 100 miles shorter. Uh, a little bit less on the, on the way out of Baltimore, $2.54. Uh, all in rate per mile, so this is what you'd be paying the carrier. Confidence score of a two, so you, you got a little bit more uh, volatility in this rate right here. Uh, like I say it's below the NTID, but if we reverse it around going back, uh, I believe we're paid a little bit better on the next chart here when we hit a little double arrows, reverse it back to Indianapolis, going back to Baltimore, it's 338. So you're averaging pretty close to the same. You're 100 miles less. This might be a better run for you simply because on that 700 mile run, it may take uh, an extra half a day because of the timing and ELD. So you might do better at the, the, the 597 mile run. Uh, last but not least here, we'll jump in one more, Juliet to Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, coming out of Juliet, $4.77. I turned the reefer on because this is what we saw in our reefer map. So reefer out of Juliet, going down to Louisville, Kentucky, 477 a mile. Flip it back, 408 on the return. So here's a good lane that's averaging over $4 a mile. Looks like we're going to be off to the races over there as well. Thank you so much, Donnie. That's it for the Care Update, though. You all have a wonderful weekend. We're going to toss it over next to Isaiah for our social roundabout. Welcome into Social Roundabout, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and in this segment, we take a look at what's trending on social media. Now, the ocean can be a pretty scary place, especially when you're crossing the ocean, maybe in a container ship and you run into a storm and there are massive waves just causing a lot of chaos on the ship. Take a look at some of these videos of sh container ships going through some big storms. Now, Salvor Cogliano tells me that those aren't even really that bad. And if those aren't that bad, then I really don't want to know what bad looks like because, ooh, that's going to be a no from me on those. Now, we're going to switch things up a little bit. We talked earlier this week about how Sonic is going to be bringing back their pickle juice slush. And I think that Doritos is trying to one-up them on flavors that nobody asked for. So ketchup is a very popular flavor in, for their chips in, uh, in Canada. And now they're breaking that flavor available to everyone. And it's going to be available on Frito-Lays.com. There they are right there. They're going to have ketchup and mustard. Now, this ketchup flavor is going to be one that is going to taste slightly different for people who buy it off the website than it does in Canada. They did say that it's not going to be the exact same taste. Now, the, uh, the mustard flavor is actually going to be based on Chinese spicy mustard. So it's going to have a little bit of a kick to it. Now, those I would try, but the ketchup ones... Couldn't even pay me to eat it. Ketchup is a bottom tier condiment. Let's think of all the ones that are better. You got barbecue sauce, you got sriracha, you got ranch, honey mustard. I mean, the list goes on. Chick-fil-A sauce. I mean, honestly, guys, the list, it goes on and on. I mean, ketchup is just, it's down here. So 
Sorry to Anthony Smith. You know, my arm kind of hurting last time he hit me after I said that he should probably stop eating ketchup, so I'm a little sore right now. That's all I got for this edition of The Social Roundabout. I'm going to toss things over to Bill Priestley for our next roundtable. And welcome into the roundtable, Bill Priestley here, and uh, taking, I don't know how to segue out of that to, to what we're going to be talking about now, but nevertheless, uh, we're going to be talking about port congestion, and joining us, our Associate Professor of History, uh, Dr. Sal Mercagliano, and also Greg Miller, our Senior Writer here at Freight Waves. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, when we kind of organized this, uh, I guess about a week ago or so ago, uh, we I had one intro to try and bring to you, and... Luckily enough, the timing was great that the FMC now looking for public comment into whether or not we have a state of emergency in terms of our port congestion. So, Greg, I'll just start with you. Do we have a state of emergency in terms of our port congestion? Yeah, I mean, people thought uh, people thought this was over, and it's not over. Um, if you look at what's going on with port congestion, you know, back in January 2021, this started to get a lot of attention. We had 40 container ships off LA Long Beach. Um, it went down in the spring and then in the fall of 2021, it really ramped up. And so beginning, so I'd say in January of this year, uh, we had 109 container ships off LALB. And if you looked at entire North America, we had about 150. Then it came down again in the spring. And then in June and July, things really tr started to change. Uh, in, in July, again, we had 150 container ships off North America, just, just at the, like as the peak. Uh, but the, the difference here is that there's right now there's only about 10 container ships off LALB. That's not the problem. The problem is the east and the Gulf Coast. We have, you know, 20-ish container ships off uh, New York, New Jersey, another 20 or so off Houston, uh, and, you know, upper 30s off, off Savannah. Um, Hoppig Lloyd uh, said last Friday that they counted 48 container ships off Savannah with wait times of 14 to 18 days. Maris put the wait times at 10 to 17 days. Uh, so there's still a problem, a uh, big problem. Yeah. It's a different one. Sal, let me shift the, the attention just a little bit. Is this a reflection of just American consumerism? That is, it, we have an inability to keep up with how much we want, or is this an efficiency problem that starts at the ports? What do you think? I think it's a little bit of both, Bill. I think one of the issues we have is we're still transitioning out of the post-COVID economy or COVID economy into a post-COVID economy. And retailers and consumers are not sure what this economy is going to look like. Are we going to be at home? Or are we going to be in the office? And so a lot of goods are coming over. We're shifting back to a lot more durable goods than we had before. And so the shipping companies are able to accommodate that. And, and so they're moving goods over in large quantities. You know, to go back to the question you had a second ago, you know, I think if this was last year, of course, the FMC, if they had that power, would have declared a poor congestion emergency. Now they're sitting here and they have that power and it's a big question about whether they do it or not. But I, I agree with Greg entirely that this has been a problem that has been simmering on the back burner here for a long time. If you look at LA and Long Beach, since January, they've been upticking in the number of containers sitting in their yard. It's been slowly creeping back up again. And that's an indication that we have problems moving goods out of those ports into the interior. Uh, look at Maersk's recent uh, heat table. They're showing, you know, congestion at a lot of these ports. You know, Savannah will tell you they're moving ships in and out. Their problem is just getting the goods moved out of the terminals into the warehouses. And I think that's where a lot of the issues is coming from right now. Greg, one of the issues that uh, that you brought up about this, of course, and, and, and we've seen a lot of talk about it, of course, is the president and the government uh, wanting Shipping rates to come down, obviously, they've skyrocketed over the course of the past two years. Uh, what does this all mean for rates? Well, you know, rates are going to come down, but uh, the, the, as long as the congestion uh, lasts, it's going to keep the spot rates from coming down even further. So it's going to put a floor on the rates. And I, I just want to go back to something you just, you, you just asked Sal about you know, what, what's causing all this. Uh, the analogy I sort of use, I live in Manhattan and I think about the Lincoln Tunnel. Coming from New Jersey through the Lincoln Tunnel, uh, unless it's four in the morning on a Wednesday, there's always gonna be traffic there. Uh, and sometimes on Friday Friday nights, the traffic is, is very, very long. So let's say the Lincoln Tunnel 
and, and you still get through the tunnel. Uh, it may take you an hour, but the tunnel still works. It's just that uh, it takes you time to do it. And so, you know, if say there's an index number for the tunnel of 100, where beneath that you go right through and after that you get caught in traffic, I think about the port system is the same way. And because we've gone through uh, this period with COVID, we're, we're over the index level uh, and it's going to back up. And it doesn't mean the ports don't necessarily work. It's just that at this level of import demand, uh, you're going to have a queue. Um, and so so that's where I think we are. And OK, uh, some of the import demand has de- has decreased. I mean, you can see it in the bookings. You can see it in our numbers. Hoppe Lloyd talked about it, that the demand for imports has increased. But it hasn't, de- I'm sorry, decreased. It hasn't decreased enough uh, to stop this queue. And there is still the queue. Of course, that, that's always going to be there, at least in terms of those these high demand periods. And of course, as you mentioned, coming out of COVID, um, Sal, uh, let's turn. Obviously, the FMC you know, has this question of whether or not to declare a state of emergency. Looking past that, or looking through it, uh, solutions. I mean, uh, where, where are we at in terms of maybe uh, alleviating some of the pressure that the ports are handling right now? Well, I, I think what we're seeing is that LA and Long Beach were, wasn't an isolated case with the issue of being able to handle large volumes. You know, everyone wanted to blame LA and Long Beach for everything last year. You know, it was all their problems and it was their their fault. What we're seeing is we have a system that's geared to a certain level. Go back to Greg's analogy right there. It's geared to a certain level. And when you start pushing more cargo through the system, it's not designed to kick up more than a few percentage points. And when it does, you create the backlogs. You create the congestion. So I I think there's no doubt that there are issues at play here that are causing the congestion. And I I tend to think that the FMC will declare this. They have this new power. They've got they've got a new toy in their box that they want to play with. And that's going to be the next thing that happens here. They're going to get these proposals in and a lot of, you know, shippers who are going to be complaining about getting their cargo late are going to want to take advantage of this. And we're going to see the FMC want to use this new felon power that they have to start making issues. But again, I I think one of the things that we're seeing here is we saw this shift happening at the end of last year. We knew that people were going to start shifting their cargo because of the backlog at LA and Long Beach, but also because of the contract renegotiation going on with the ILWU and the PMA. They didn't want to get caught in LA and Long Beach and have all their goods coming there. So what we've done is started putting a lot of pressure on our other ports. Houston, uh, Savannah, and New York, New Jersey are the perfect examples of that four corner strategy being used by a lot of shippers. Yeah, Greg, let's let's examine that a little bit. Obviously, you know, we've had a number of ships go through the Panama Canal and come out to the eastern eastern coast as well. Looking at solutions at the same time, uh, how much of this backlog is coming from the Far East and how much of it perhaps is also coming from Europe as well? Well, there's two things going on now. Number one, you know, as Sal said, you know, it's clear that uh, the shippers, uh, uh, you know, took a defensive strategy based upon the ILWU contract negotiations. And there was also, they looked at what happened last peak season in LALB, and it's clear that they moved everything over uh, to the Eastern Gulf. So that's one thing. And the other thing that's different this time around is that uh, to go back to the traffic jam analogy, it's like uh, there's a there's a traffic jam at the exit point in the tunnel in Manhattan now and backing things up. So you have a problem with the warehouses and the rail that's sort of back backing things up at the same time that uh, there's this shift going on. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, talking about more longer term issues, you know, one thing I would like to bring up also is that. You know, what if we were close to capacity right before COVID and COVID put us over the top? But let's say we revert to sort of a historical trend line, which is always going up. And let's say uh, 2024, 2025, you know, the natural, you know, forget about all the COVID disruptions, the natural growth of United States imports puts us past sort of that, you know, basic index point I was talking about, where after that you have the backup. And what happens if what we've seen over COVID is what we're going to always see uh, in the years to come, unless we come up with some different solutions? And, and talk a little bit about the uh, the, the uh, state of emergency. What kind of a timetable, perhaps, are you thinking that, that the FMC may work on? And, and how long, what are they going to take out of that going forward? Well, I mean, the, the uh, OSRA gives them a 60-day window 
to operate under. And I think one of the things they're going to try to do is identify some key issues that they can address almost immediately. I think the big thing that they're going to want to do is the detention and demerge. The stories that you've all been running, talking about what's going on in New York, New Jersey, for example, and a lot of these other ports have gotten a lot of attention where people are getting hammered with these massive uh, delay fees right now in not able to access their boxes. And, you know, you just had the the uh, port envoy, Steve Lyons, come out uh, and talk about the fact that going 24-7 does no good unless the entire system goes 24-7. So I think you're going to see some ideas of some manageable or at least uh, objectives that can be obtained in the short term. I think they have to be very careful if you're the FMC of going too far over the edge and doing more than than was in your capacity to do. So I think if they do wind up in the issuing this, this emergency decree, they're going to set finite goals that they can achieve going forward. Yeah, Greg, uh, same question. What, what do you think the FMC is going to do with the timetable they've got? Um, you know, they're, they're going to do the best they can uh, to sort of use the, you know, the powers they have uh, to pressure carriers uh, to do a better job here with the information and, and the fees. Uh, there's only so much they can do, though. So, uh, it, I, again, I, I, I really think it comes back down to uh, uh, sort of, you know, what the import demand is and what the in inherent capacity of the system is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, cynical on, you know, what can actually be, I mean, you can, you can make some, some improvements on the margins, but I think it's a, the central problem here is just, there's just too much trying to get through. This is definitely an issue that we're going to keep some, some strong attention to over the course of next month as we go into 2023 and beyond. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this discussion. We'll take a short break here and we'll come back and wrap up the rest of our show. This iteration of Sonar is our most powerful solution yet, built specifically for the power user. The inspiration behind Freightways was the Bloomberg of Freight. We are welcoming two extremely special guests to the show. One of them is the real wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort. Jordan, thank you for joining us on the air. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. The idea of the Freightways Live experience is to bring you into the action, make you a part of the experience. What does this have to do with freight? Well, I'm glad you asked. People are wondering what's going to happen with inflation. Is there going to be hyperinflation? When is hyperinflation going to be here? When is there going to be inflation? What's going to happen with inflation? Inflation, inflation, inflation. This is the sexiest topic within the economy right now. Back to you, Freight Waves Now. It's time for one last check of the weather before we head out of here on your Friday morning. Right now, we're going to talk about some heavy rainfall moving once again over the central and southern Wisconsin area, possibly impacting the Chicago metro here in the next few hours, with the potential to have maybe a couple of embedded severe storms in there. So let's check that out in sonar critical events. Right now, we're watching this pretty large area of rainfall that's diving south, honestly, really pretty quickly out of Minnesota and into Wisconsin. This is going to be on the heels of that kind of early fall cold front that we're seeing move through the area, which will drop temperatures to a pretty nice range for the central parts of the Great Lakes area and then eventually down here into the southeast. So we're watching this pretty heavy rainfall move through the Minneapolis-St. Paul region right now in through Eau Claire, Washington, Washington, Wisconsin, eventually going to impact the Madison area and down to Chicago later on today. The leading edge of the storm could see the potential for some strong winds as well as some heavy rainfall. Not expecting any overarching severe weather threats today, but there is always that potential as that line moves on through. The heavy rainfall will continue to move through, and there are some potential for flooding in that southern Wisconsin area. So we've got some flood watches up across the area, as well as um, some flood warnings in place for some of the smaller cities. They've gotten a pretty decent amount of rain here the, next few, the last few days. 
So there is a potential for some of those low-lying roads and those creeks and streams to continue to flood. With that, we're going to see kind of a clearing and a cooling for the eastern half of the United States for the weekend. So it's going to be pretty nice, especially after several weeks of continued temperatures in those mid-90s to 100s and after that heat wave that ran through the northeast earlier last week. Other than that, it should be a nice weekend ahead for most of us. We'll talk a little bit more about some rainfall and some storms and maybe keep an eye on that potential for the tropical development over the weekend. Right now, we're going to head back over to Sydney Edwards. She's got one final check of our top stories. With the last check of our headlines this morning, I'm Sydney Edwards. Now, Daimler Truck reported improved top and bottom lines for the second quarter, but expressed concern for the full year financial results, citing the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Daimler's production plants in Germany could be in trouble if Russia decides to restrict gas imports to the country, which could inhibit finished truck deliveries. Now, in quarter two, those inhibitions led to a negative free cash flow of $781 million. The company also highlighted driver shortage, inflation, and interest rate increases as, has, as headwinds for the rest of the year, with the German bank raising interest rates in July for the first time in 11 years. However, the company said it delivered over 120,000 units last quarter and increased its revenue by almost $3 billion. And flexible warehousing tech company Stored announced a new initiative, Stored One Commerce, last month, and it has allowed for new opportunities like drainage capabilities to enter the network. The net new offering also includes cold chain storage through a partnership with Fresh Del Monte, custom packaging capabilities, and e-commerce returns. The company said the additions are to complete a port-to-porch -port supply chain so brands can manage the whole process of getting goods to consumer hands. And federal prosecutors have dropped charges against former executives at Saladon Group. The case alleged that two execs devised a scheme that defrauded excuse me, the company out of more than $62 million and charged former CEO William Meek and CFO Bobby Peebler with nine counts of fraud each. The Department of Justice moved to dismiss the charges, quote, in the interest of justice, but gave no other comment on the dismissal. A trial had been set for September 6th prior to this dismissal. Now you can find these details to stories and so much more at FreightWaves.com and of course on our FreightWaves app. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like and subscribe for the full FreightWaves TV experience. However, you can head to TV.FreightWaves.com. We'll hand this back over to Kaylee and Anthony for the rest of the show. Thank you, Sydney, for those updates. And that does it for us here on this Friday morning for Freight Waves Now. But we've got a bunch more stuff to wrap up your end of the week. That's right. We have What the Truck coming on in just about an hour. And soon after that, we're also going to have Net Zero Carbon. Absolutely. Following that, we've got Mad Gains. And Sydney will be back with Running on Ice this afternoon as well, the coolest community in Freight. While we're headed into the weekend, make sure that you head to live.freightwaves.com and get registered for next week's virtual event. That is the Supply Chain Meets FinTech event put on by both us here at FreightWaves and Payments.com and sponsored by Silent Pay, our headline sponsor there. Free to attend, so make sure that you get on in. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for sticking with us this morning. We will be back Monday morning starting live at 9 a.m. Whatever your shipment, no matter the mode of transport, the real-time location and condition of your shipment matters. With time